Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, we can't hear you Maharaj. Uh, since your camera and the mic is uh, mute Maharaj. Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Yes, yes Maharaj, can hear you yes. now, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Om Magyana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shavakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Guru Recording in progress. Panchakaupatarubhyascha kripa sindhu vai evacha patitanam pavane bhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhat Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhattavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Oh Krishna, what happened? We're on mantra five. Okay. Mantra five. Tad ejati tad naijati tad dure tad vantike tad antarasya sarvasya tad sarvasya bayataha. Translation. The Supreme Lord walks and he does not walk. He is far away but he is very near as well. He is within everything and yet he is outside of everything. Okay. So this is a very important verse, often quoted, and we should understand the meaning. This verse explains to us the inconceivable potency of the Lord. In order for us to understand the Lord, we have to understand that he has inconceivable potencies and these inconceivable potencies are described here in this verse right that he walks and he doesn't walk it's a contradiction how could somebody walk and not walk he's far away but he's very near as well is within everything, yet he is outside of everything. So, it appears to be contradictory. We have to understand how the inconceivable potencies are being described here.
All right, so Prabhupada's purport is very elaborate and instructive. We will go through it here. Here is a description of some of the Supreme Lord's transcendental activities executed by his inconceivable potencies. The contradictions given here prove the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. He walks and he does not walk. Ordinarily, if someone can walk, it is illogical to say he cannot walk. But in reference to God, such a contradiction simply serves to indicate his inconceivable power. With our limited fund of knowledge, we cannot accommodate such contradictions, and therefore we conceive of the Lord in terms of our limited powers of understanding. For example, the impersonalist philosophers of the Mayavadi school accept only the Lord's impersonal activities and reject his personal features. But the members of the Bhagavata school adopting the perfect conception of the Lord accept his inconceivable potencies and thus understand that he is both personal and impersonal. The Bhagavatas know that without inconceivable potencies there can be no meaning to the words Supreme Lord. So it's important for us to understand these points. Uh, the impersonalists, Mayavadis, they will deny the personal features of the Lord and they will simply concentrate on the, the impersonal feature. But the devotees the, in, our, in our line of the cyclic succession, we say that the Lord is both personal and impersonal because he's the supreme lord so he has unlimited potencies we, if if we restrict him then he's not the supreme lord anymore if we say for example all oh, the lord is only personal and not impersonal then we're placing a restriction on the Lord. And if we say the Lord is impersonal and not personal, then this is also a restriction. So we have to understand that in the Bhagavad philosophy, we say that the Lord is both personal and impersonal. And this way we understand the Supreme Lord having inconceivable potencies. Prabhupada continues, We should not take it for granted that because we cannot see God with our eyes, the Lord has no personal existence. Sri Ishopanishad refutes this argument by declaring that the Lord is far away, but very near also. The abode of the Lord is beyond the material sky, and we have no means to measure even this material sky. If the material sky extends so far, then what to speak of the spiritual sky, which is altogether beyond it. That the spiritual sky is situated far, far away from the material universe 
is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 15.6. But despite the Lord's being so far away, he can at once, within less than a second, descend before us with a speed swifter than that of the mind or wind. He can also run so swiftly that no one can surpass him. This has already been described in the previous mantra. Right? You remember the previous mantra that it was described how the the it, it can overcome all of others running. So no one can overcome the Lord. He can overcome everyone because he is the Supreme Lord. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining logically that the material world is unlimitedly so vast and what to speak of the spiritual world which is much greater. The spiritual world is three-fourths and the material sky is only one-fourth. But the material sky is unlimited. It's so huge that we cannot measure it. So what to speak of the spiritual world? Prabhupada continues. Yet when the personality of Godhead comes before us, we neglect him. Such foolish negligence is condemned by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita 9.11, where he says that the foolish deride him, considering him a mortal being. He is not a mortal being, nor does he come before us with a body produced of material nature. There are many so-called scholars who contend that the Lord descends in a body made of matter, just like an ordinary living being. Not knowing his inconceivable power, such foolish men place the Lord on an equal level with ordinary men. So this is the, the problem. Lord Krishna himself identified this problem in the Bhagavad Gita when he said that the foolish mock at me descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. So Srila Prabhupada explains to us there, there are scholars who argue that when the Lord comes, he comes in a material body, just like an ordinary living being. They don't know his inconceivable power. So such foolish men place the Lord on an equal level with themselves. We have to understand that the Lord is the Supreme Lord over everything. Then he has inconceivable powers. And if he wants to come into this world, he can come. And he does in his different incarnations, the Lord descends to perform his different pastimes. Prabhupada continues, because the Lord is full of inconceivable potencies, God can accept our service through any sort of medium and he can convert his different potencies according to his own will. Non-believers argue either that the Lord cannot incarnate himself at all, 
or that if he does, he descends in a form of material energy. These arguments are nullified if we accept the existence of the Lord's inconceivable potencies. Then we will understand that even if the Lord appears before us in the form of material energy, it is quite possible for him to convert this energy into spiritual energy. Since the source of the energies is one and the same, the energies can be utilized according to the will of their source. For example, the Lord can appear in the form of the Archa Vigraha, a deity supposedly made of earth or stone or wood. Deity forms, although engraved from wood, stone or other matter, are not idols as the iconoclasts contend. So Srila Prabhupada is giving us some examples of the inconceivable potency of the Lord. And he gives us the example of the deities, the Archavigraha, how these forms of the Lord are fully spiritual because the Lord enters into that form. And so it becomes a spiritual form. The Lord can convert matter into spirit because he has inconceivable potency. So we have to understand this point that if the Lord wants to convert matter into spirit, he can do it. Just like when we offer food to the Lord, the food is material, but we offer it to the Lord, it becomes spiritualized. Prabhupada continues, in our present state of imperfect material existence, we cannot see the Supreme Lord due to imperfect vision. Yet those devotees who want to see him by means of material vision are favored by the Lord who appears in a so-called material form to accept his devotee's service. One should not think that such devotees who are in the lowest stage of devotional service are worshipping an idol. They are factually worshipping the Lord who has agreed to appear before them in an approachable way. Nor is the archa form fashioned according to the whims of the worshipper. This form is eternally existent with all paraphernalia, and this can be actually felt by a sincere devotee, but not by an atheist. So Prabhupada is explaining to us how <coughs> the Lord reveals himself to the devotees. The devotees are worshipping the Lord and the Lord reciprocates with their worship. He reveals himself to them. So Prabhupada said, when the devotee is not simply worshipping an idol, but the deity is a living form of the Lord. The Lord enters into the, the deity. <coughs> so, so devotees are worshipping this form of the Lord and they enjoy transcendental loving exchanges with the Lord by offering their worship. 
offering worship like dressing and bathing, and offering arti and cooking for the Lord, all of these different items of deity worship, they can all be done for the pleasure of the deity. So Prabhupada explains this form of the deity is eternally existing with all paraphernalia. But only the sincere devotees can actually feel this. Those who are atheists, they won't be able to enjoy that loving exchange with the Lord. But the devotee, by dint of their pure love for the Lord, they can feel they can feel the presence of the Lord in the deity. And we see every day devotees, we enjoy going to the temple to see the deities. It's very pleasing and satisfying to the mind to go and see the deities, and to offer prayers, to offer obeisances, to offer worship to the deities. So this is the mercy of the Lord, that he comes in the deity form for the pleasure of his devotees. Prabhupada continues, in the Bhagavad Gita, the 4.11, the Lord says that, the, the Lord says that how he treats his devotee depends on the devotee's degree of surrender, right? In the Bhagavad Gita 4.11, Lord Krishna says, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So Prabhupada is paraphrasing that verse. Prabhupada says, the Lord reserves the right not to reveal himself to anyone and everyone but, but to show himself only to those souls who surrender unto him. Thus, for the surrendered soul, he is always within reach, whereas for the unsurrendered soul, he is far away and cannot be approached. All right? So, the important point is surrender. If you have, if we have surrendered, then we enjoy this transcendental reciprocation with the Lord. The Lord reveals himself to those devotees who have taken shelter of him, who have surrendered to him. He, he, he's happy to reveal himself to them. Srila Prabhupada continues, in this connection, two words, two words, uh, in the, the revealed scripture, two words, in, in, this, in this connection, two words, the revealed scriptures, Uh, sight apply to the Lord. Saguna meaning with qualities and nirguna meaning without qualities are very important. So the word saguna does not imply that when the Lord appears with perceivable qualities he must take on a material form and be subject to the laws of material nature. For him, there is no difference between the material and spiritual energies because he is the source of all energies. As the as the controller of all energies, 
he cannot at any time be under the influence as we are. The material energy works according to the direction, according to his direction. Therefore, he can see that energy, he can, he can, he can use that energy for his purpose without ever being influenced by any of the qualities of the energy. In, in this sense, he is nirguna, without qualities. Nor does the Lord become a formless entity at any time, for ultimately he is the eternal form, the prime evil Lord, the impersonal aspect or the Brahman effulgence is but the glow of his personal rays, just as the sun's rays are the glow of the sun god. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us the significance of these two words, nirguna and saguna. Nirguna meaning without qualities and saguna with qualities. So the Lord is without, is without material qualities, but he's with spiritual qualities. Right? The Lord takes on these different qualities. He can take on a material form, but he may take on a material form, but he's not under the laws of the material nature. He is the source of all energies. He is the controller of any everything. So the material energy works according to his direction. So he can use that energy for his purpose. And he's never influenced by any of the qualities. So the Lord does not become a formless entity at any time. He is the eternal form. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us how the Lord is the controller of the material energy. And he can take these different forms. He can appear in a material form. And it can be spiritual. He, he is not under the laws of the material nature. Because he himself is the controller of the material nature. So it's an important point to understand how the Lord is both Nirguna and Saguna. He has qualities and he's without qualities. Prabhupada continues, when the child saint Prahlad Maharaj was in the presence of his atheistic father, his father asked him, where is your God? When Prahlad replied that God resides everywhere, the father angrily asked whether his god was within one of the pillars of the palace, and the child said yes. At once the atheistic king shattered the pillar in front of him to pieces, and the Lord instantly appeared as Narsimha, the half-man, half-lion incarnation and killed the atheistic king. Thus the Lord is within everything and he creates everything for, he creates everything by his different energies. Through his inconceivable powers, he can appear at any place in order to favor his 
sincere devotee. Lord Nishinga appeared from within the pillar, not by the order of the atheistic king, but by the wish of his devotee Prahlad. An atheist cannot order the Lord to appear, but the Lord will appear anywhere and everywhere by or to show mercy to his devotee. The Bhagavad Gita 4.8 similarly states that the Lord appears in order to vanquish non-believers and protect believers. Of course, the Lord has sufficient energies and agents who can vanquish atheists, but it pleases him to personally favor a devotee. Therefore, he descends as an incarnation. Actually, he descends only to favor his devotees and not for any other purpose. So, Srila Prabhupada is referring to the Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter. The Lord describes Yada uh, Yadahi Dharmasya Glani Bhavati Bharata Abhutanama Dharmasya Tadatmanamsha. In order to establish religious principles, as well as to annihilate the miscreants and give pleasure to his devotees, then the Lord appears. And Prabhupada explains actually the real purpose of the Lord coming is for the pleasure of his devotees. The Lord is controlled by the pure love of his devotees. So when the atheistic king Hiranyakashipu was asked, where is the God? It, it wasn't just because Haranyakashipu wanted to see God, or what, he didn't have anything to do with it, but it was because the Lord wanted to give pleasure to Prahlad. The Lord was concerned for his devotee, Prahlad, and he'd, he'd seen how Prahlad had been put through so much suffering. Haranyakashipu had been trying to kill Prahlad in so many ways. So the Lord was feeling aggrieved. He was feeling pain to see his devotee suffering. So the Lord came in the form of Narsinga Dev. And of course, he gave pleasure to Prahlad Maharaj. And he also annihilated the atheistic king, Haranyakashipu. But the Lord doesn't have to come to kill the demons. He can send other people to do that. He can kill demons without coming himself. But his real purpose in coming is to give pleasure to his devotees. And we see that in the Srimad Bhagavatam is described how after Lord Nishringadeva appeared and killed the demon, Aranyakashipu, that Lord Nishringadeva was very angry because his devotee Prahlad had been treated so badly. And it, different demigods all came to offer prayers to Lord Nishringadeva, and nobody could pacify the Lord. And it was only Prahlad who could come and offer prayers to Lord Nishringadeva and pacify him. So this was the loving exchange between Lord Nishringadev and his devotee Prahlad. So the Lord's purpose in coming is to give pleasure for his devotee. Okay, we'll just finish off this report here. Yeah. In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that Govinda, the primeval Lord, enters everything by his plenary portion. 
he enters the universe as well as all the atoms of the universe. He is outside in his virata form and he is within everything as antaryami. As antaryami, he witnesses everything that is going on and he awards us the results of our actions as karma foul. We ourselves may forget that we have, we, we may forget what we have done in previous lives. But because the Lord witnesses our actions, the results of our actions are always there. And we have to undergo the reactions nonetheless. All right, so Srila Prabhupada is describing the omnipresence of the Lord, how the Lord is, he, is, he enters everything by his plenary portion. He enters the universe as well as the atoms of the universe. And he is outside in his virata form, virata form meaning the universal form, and he is within everything as antaryami, antaryami, the super soul. So he is within as a super soul and he is outside in the form of the universal form. And he's within every atom. He's everywhere, within everything. And he's awarding us the results of our actions. Prabhupada is explaining that because he's a witness to all of our activities, so he knows what we have done in the past, he knows our deeds, he knows our where we're at, he knows what kind of activities we've been performing and he's awarding us the results of these different activities. We all suffer and enjoy the karma fall, right? The fruit of our past activities. Some suffering and some good things. So the Lord is the witness to all of these things. And he remembers also previous lives. We don't remember, of course, the previous lives, but we know many, many births, both you and I have had. Lord Krishna said, I can remember all of them, you cannot. So we get the results of whatever activities we're performing. Then the final paragraph. The fact is that there is nothing but God within and without. Everything is a manifestation of his different energies, like the heat and the light emanating from a fire. And in this way, there is a oneness among his diverse energies. Although there is oneness, however, the Lord in his personal form still enjoys unlimitedly all the pleasures enjoyed minutely by the tiny part and parcel living entities. Oh, so the Lord is everywhere and in everything. So Prabhupada said there's nothing but God within and without. Everything is his energy. And it's all the different energies. An example was given just like heat and light coming from a fire. So in the same way, there is a, a oneness among his diverse energies. 
a oneness that it's all his energy it's all the energy of the Lord and the Lord in his personal form enjoys unlimitedly all the pleasures enjoyed minutely by the tiny parts and parcels living in now we are the tiny parts and parcels and we enjoy <laughs> we enjoy in a, minutely in small ways but the lord he enjoys unlimitedly in his personal form he's enjoying unlimited so we want to try to appreciate the inconceivable potencies of the lord so this is a very nice verse and try to understand that when these contradictions are mentioned it's to indicate that the lord has inconceivable potencies are there any questions on this mantra before we go on Well, you have to cultivate some devotion in them. They have to develop some devotion. Unless they have some devotion, then they'll never understand how the deity, they'll never understand the Lord in the deity form. So you have to, you have to cultivate devotion in them through the process of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting. So they have to hear and chant. Deity worship comes later. But first get people to hear and chant. If people don't have a taste for hearing and chanting, then they won't understand these things. So you have to cultivate them through the, the process of hearing and chanting. Shravanam and Kirtan, then gradually you can come to give up. Uh, you can come to give up devotion. Uh, you can get them to give up their materialistic conception of the deity. people don't have devotion then of course it will be difficult to, they won't be able to understand the form of the Lord in the deity so it takes some time to cultivate people's devotion they have to see they have to learn to see the deity through the eyes of the scriptures Okay. Aisha Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, um, in Prabhupada's purpose, uh, Prabhupada mentioned that uh, he descends, that Krishna descends because to favor his devotees and not for other any other purpose. He, he descends only to favor his devotees. So can we say like the incarnations like Buddha and Kalki will also be because he favors his devotees? Yes. Yes, also. Yeah. In what sense, Maharaj? Well, Lord Buddha, he came to lead the people, the atheistic people who didn't have any faith, they had faith in him. So they followed him, they followed Buddha. They didn't have faith in anything else, but they had faith in the Buddha and they followed the Buddha. So in that way, he could deliver them. 
whatever. They didn't believe in God, they didn't believe in scriptures, mm -hmm. but they had faith in Buddha. So they followed the Buddha, and in that way they got great benefit to be liberated. As for, Kal as for Kalki, well, the Lord comes as Kalki and he kills the, the, he kills the people who are remaining at the end of the Kali Yuga. He kills them. So uh, by killing them, then they're all liberated. They all get to go to the uh, Brahma Jyoti. They get impersonal liberation. So that's the favor of the Lord on them. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. So we'll go ahead. Mantra number six. Yes to Sarvani Bhutani Atmani Vanupashyati Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam Tatomam Vigya Gupsate He who systematically sees everything in relation to the Supreme Lord, who sees all living entities as his parts and parcels, and who sees the Supreme Lord within everything, never hates anything nor any being. So this is a description of the great devotee, how a Maha Bhagavat devotee will see everything. He sees everything in relation to the Lord. And he sees all living entities as his parts and parcels. He sees the Supreme Lord within everything and he never hates anything or any being. So this is a, a de Mahabhagavat devotee. Prabhupada tells us here in the purport, this is a description of the Mahabhagavat, the great personality who sees everything in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord's presence is realized in three stages. The Kanista Adhikari is in the lowest stage of realization. He goes to a place of worship, such as a temple, church, or mosque, according to his religious faith, and worships there according to scriptural injunctions. Devotees in this stage, consider the Lord to be present at the place of worship and nowhere else. They cannot ascertain who is in what position in devotional service. Nor can they tell who has realized the Supreme Lord. Such devotees follow the routine formulas and sometimes quarrel among themselves, considering one type of devotion better than another. These Kanista Adhikaris are actually materialistic devotees who are simply trying to transcend the material boundary. to reach the spiritual plane. All right, so Prabhupada begins his purport here by explaining to us about the Kanista Adhikari. Kanista meaning the junior devotee or the one in the, the lowest stage 
of realization. So it's described how the Kanista Adhikari will go, he will go to a place of worship and he thinks that the Lord is only in that place of worship. He doesn't see the Lord in the heart of every living entity. He doesn't see the Lord everywhere. He only sees the Lord in the temple or in the church or in the mosque. So this is the Kanista understanding. Some people, well, it's some people is common. People think like this. They think that God is in the temple. He's not anywhere else. He's only in the temple. And these people uh, they these people they they often argue with each other. They cannot understand who is in what position. They can't understand how some people are more advanced than others. And so they will sometimes argue with each other about what's the better way, what's the highest path. Like this, they will, they will find ways, reasons to argue with each other. The people like to think that whatever path they're following is the best. So, a devotee should be careful not to think like that, you know. We don't want to quarrel with people. We don't want to argue about things. But the Kanista Adhikaris, they are sometimes described as being materialistic devotees. Materialistic in the sense that they're trying to overcome the modes of nature, but they're still influenced by the modes of nature. They haven't really come to the spiritual platform. So Kanista devotee is also a devotee, and certainly we should respect them. We should respect all devotees. Yeah. At the same time, we should understand the limitation of the Kanista devotee. All right. Then Prabhupada continues, those who have attained the second stage of realization are called Madhyama Adhikaris. Right? So you've got Kanista Adhikaris and then Madhyama Adhikaris. These devotees observe the distinctions between four categories of being. So the four distinctions are they see the Supreme Lord, they see the devotees of the Lord, they see the innocent who have no knowledge of the Lord, and they see also the atheists who have no faith in the Lord and hate those in devotional service. So the Majjama Adhikari behaves differently towards these four classes of persons. 
he adores the Lord, considering him the object of love. He makes friends with those who are in devotional service. He tries to awaken the dormant love of God in the hearts of the innocent, and he avoids the atheists who deride the very name of the Lord. So we, we learn from this description how a Madhyama Adhikari should relate to different people. Right? He should offer his worship to the Supreme Lord. And then he should associate with and make friends with those devotees who uh, are practicing devotional service. We want to recognize devotees and we want to keep friendly relationships with them. And then he tries to awaken dormant love in the hearts of the innocent. You get some people who are just innocent, they just don't know. So the innocent people, so if somebody is innocent, they, they should be submissive willing to hear and and in that way they can become a good candidate for devotional service but at the same time if somebody is an atheist if somebody is a blasphemer then you don't want to spend time with this person you don't want to get into arguments with him we don't want to be involved in arguing with the atheists and blasphemers because they will just become more, more offensive. So that's not good. We don't want them to become more offensive. We want to encourage them in their Krishna consciousness. The best thing we can do for them is to avoid them. Just keep out of their way. Because if, if we try to preach to them, they will just become more offensive. So the best thing we can do for them is just to avoid them and stay away from them. So this is uh, how the Majjama Adhikari has to deal with different people. He has, in other words, he has to make distinction. He has to make distinction between who is a devotee and who is not a devotee. Somebody is not a devotee, then there's two categories. One, the person may be innocent, we can try to preach to him. But if somebody is just an atheist and a blasphemer, then better just to leave them. Don't agitate them. So this is the vision of the Madhyama Adhikari. He makes distinctions. And then, Above the Madhyama Adhikari is the Uttama Adhikari, who sees everything in relation to the Supreme Lord. Such a devotee does not discriminate between an atheist and a theist, but sees everyone as part and parcel of God. He knows that there is no essential difference between a vastly learned brahmana and a dog in the street because both of them are part and parcel of the Lord although they are encaged in different bodies on account of the different qualities of their activities in their previous lives. He sees that the brahmana particle of the Supreme Lord has not misused his little independence given him by the Lord and that the dog particle has misused his independence and is therefore being punished 
by the laws of nature, by having engaged in the, in the form of a dog, not considering the respective actions of the Brahmana and the dog, the Uttama Adhikari tries to do good to both. Such a, such a learned devotee is not misled by material bodies, but is attracted by the spiritual spark within them. So Srila Prabhupada is pointing out to us here how one who is on the platform of the Uttama Adhikari, who is the topmost devotee, that he will think how to do good for every living entity. One, he Prabhupada gives the example of the Brahmana and the dog. Now, somebody is in the Brahmana body, obviously, we're going to try to give some special uh, opportunity to the Brahmana. We can teach him more about devotional service. Brahmana is considered the symbol of the mode of goodness. So, the mode of goodness, it's very good. It's not difficult for one who's a Brahmana to transcend to come out of the modes of material nature. And with the help of a Mahabhagavat devotee, the Brahmana can be brought out of the modes of nature and he can come to the transcendental platform. And the Brahmana also tries to help the dog. The Brahmana will try to help a dog. We know from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there was a great devotee named Shivananda Singh, and he gave mercy to a dog. A dog was following them when they were going, the devotees were going from Mayapur to Jagannath Puri, and a dog started to follow them. So Shivananda Singh was in charge, and he saw the dog, and he thought, this dog wants to be with the devotees. And he arranged for the dog to get prasadam every day. So that was the, that's a devotee. He's caring about the dog. We didn't think, oh, it's a, just a dog, get rid of it. But no, he was kind to the dog. And he gave it mercy. And one day when they forgot to give the dog prasadam, he was very disturbed and he fasted. But then later on, when they got to Jagannath Puri, they saw the dog was there in Jagannath Puri. And so the dog also got mercy of the devotees. So we have to also try to develop that kind of consciousness to see the Lord in the heart of all living entities, right? We don't, we don't go killing insects and so on. We don't kill even plants and so on unnecessarily. We want to use everything carefully in the service of the Lord. So this is a vision of the Uttama Adhikari to try to help every living entity that they can be benefited in their spiritual life. All right. Prabhupada continues, those who are Im those who imitate an Uttama Adhikari by flaunting a sense of oneness or fellowship but who behave on the bodily platform are actually false philanthropists. The conception of universal brotherhood must be learned from an Uttama Adhikari and not from a foolish person who does not properly understand the individual soul 
are the Supreme Lord, Super Soul Expansion, who dwells everywhere. So, that sometimes people may pretend that they have come to this platform of Uttama Adhikari and they may show, make a show of uh, oneness or fellowship and being kind to everyone, but they're not, they have not actually realized it. They, they're simply imitating that understanding. So Prabhupada explains this position of Uttama Adhikari, it has to be it has to be learned from an Uttama Adhikari, from a genuine devotee. We have to learn from a very advanced devotee how to cultivate that kind of consciousness. And such a devotee will know the difference between the Lord and the living entities. He will know that within the heart there are two souls, there's the individual soul, and there's a super soul also. So this way the Madhyama, the Uttama Adhikari, he, he sees, he has this kind of vision. Prabhupada continues, it is clearly mentioned in this sixth mantra that one should observe or systematically see this means that one must follow the previous acharyas, the, the perfected teachers. Anupashyati is the exact Sanskrit word used in this connection. Anu means to follow and pashyati means to observe. Thus, the word anupashyati means that one should not see things as he does with the naked eye, but should follow the previous acharyas. Due to material defects, the naked eye cannot see anything properly. One cannot see properly unless one has heard from a superior source, and the highest source is the Vedic wisdom, which is spoken by the Lord himself. Vedic truths are coming in disciplic succession from the Lord to Brahma, from Brahma to Narad, and from Narad to Vyas, and from Vyas to his many disciples. Formerly, there was no need to record the messages of the Vedas, because people in earlier ages were more intelligent and had sharper memories. They could follow the instructions simply by hearing once from the mouth of a bona fide spiritual master. All right, so Prabhupada is explaining uh, how we have to hear from from the acharyas, we want to learn. We have to, we have to hear from these this very advanced devotees, the acharyas, and we have to hear from them very carefully. So Prabhupada tells us about the disciplic succession, how it's based on hearing, and we have in the same way we hear. We're hearing from Srila Vyasadeva and we're hearing from so many great Acharyas in the line of Vyasadeva. We have the six Goswamis. We have Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Baladeva Vidya Bhusan. We have Bhaktivinod Thakur, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. And we have our own founder Acharya, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So we have to hear from these great acharyas. And Prabhupada explains how in the Kali Yuga, people have poor memories, very poor memories, right? 
in, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the qualities of people in the Kali Yuga are described. How we're lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. So because we're always disturbed, we don't have peace of mind, so difficult for us to remember things. We hear, and we have to hear again and again. It's difficult for us to remember everything. So many times we hear, and we have to hear again and again. So this is... This is the process of devotional service. We have to hear and hear from the bona fide spiritual teachers and gradually we'll start to remember. So that knowledge is there within us, but it has to be awakened by hearing. We hear, hear and hear and gradually we'll start to remember. Srila Prabhupada continues, at present there are many commentaries on the revealed scriptures, but most of them are not in the line of disciplic succession coming from Srila Vyasadeva, who originally compiled the Vedic wisdom. The final, most perfect and sublime work by Srila Vyasadeva is Srimad Bhagavatam which is the natural commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. There is also the Bhagavad Gita, which was spoken by the Lord himself and recorded by Vyasadeva. These are the most important revealed scriptures and any commentary that contradicts the principles of the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam is unauthorized. There is complete agreement among the Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Vedas, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and no one should try to teach or to reach any conclusion about the Vedas without receiving instructions from members of Vyasadeva's disciplic succession who believe in the personality of Godhead and his diverse energies as they are explained in Sri Ishopanishad. So Srila Prabhupada is emphasizing the importance of hearing these scriptures carefully, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and other scriptures also, hear carefully, but hear from the proper authorities, hear from the representatives of Vyasadeva. Don't go away from the parampara. If you hear from people who are not in the disciplic succession, then simply we will become confused and we'll, we'll, we won't get the real message. So it's very important for us to be careful who we hear from and simply be chased and kept here from the acharyas in our line. And finally, according to the Bhagavad Gita, only one who is already on the liberated platform, Brahma Bhuta, can become an Uttama Adhikari devotee and see every living being as his own brother. This vision cannot be had by politicians who are always after some material gain. One who imitates the symptoms of an Uttama Adhikari may serve another's, may serve another's outward body for the purpose of fame or material reward, but he does not serve the spirit soul. Such an imitator can have no information of the spiritual world. The Uttama Adhikari sees the spirit soul 
within the material body and serves him as spirit. Thus the material aspect is automatically served. So Prabhupada is qualifying, the, explaining the qualification necessary to come to this platform to become an Uttama Adhikari. Preliminary qualification is that we have to recognize that we're not the body, Brahma Bhuta, right? That we're Brahman, we're all spiritual beings. If one is attached to the material body, then one is not on the Mahabhagavat platform. One is not an Uttama Adhikari. Uttama Adhikari knows he is a spirit soul and he, is, he works for the interest of the soul. So this is the vision of the Uttama Adhikari. But other people who may try to, they may imitate the Uttama Adhikari, but they're not actually on that platform. They don't know the real purpose of the spirit soul. But the Uttama Adhikari, he knows that there's a spirit soul within the material body, and he will take interest for the soul. Right? That, that in the interest of the soul, the Uttama Adhikari will engage in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. That is the real business of the Uttama Adhikari, to hear and chant the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. So this is the, the desire of the soul, the interest of the soul. We want to serve the soul as spiritual, we have to know how to engage in bhakti yoga. It's bhakti which the soul wants. All right, any questions on this verse before we go on to next mantra? Any questions on mantra six? Maharaj? Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, just want to understand the... Uh... The mantra that uh, the translation uh, he who sees everything in relation to the Supreme Lord, who sees all living entities as his parts and parcels, who sees the Supreme Lord within everything, never hates anything or any being. When we say that this uh, who sees all living entities as his parts and parcels, is it uh, regarding the, enti the living entity seeing that uh, everyone is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord or, or how do you explain this? I'm just a bit uh, not very sure. Yes, all living entities. That is the vision of the Mahabhagwa. This is actually the Mahabhagwa's uh, uh, vision. Isn't it? Yes, Prabhupada gives an example about the dog. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, you can also think about plants and trees and so on, you know. The Prabhupada was always concerned if he saw people cutting trees, you know. He, he told the devotees one time, they cut the trees, he said, you will suffer. He didn't See. like devotees to unnecessarily interfere with any life form, any living form. So the trees, you know, they should be given freedom to grow. And uh, different insects and so on. Sometimes, the, you know, devotees would be killing all the mosquitoes and Prabhupada would say, don't turn my don't turn my resting place into a crematorium. He didn't appreciate them killing all the mosquitoes, you know. So respect for life. Yeah, we see like Magrari the hunter, 
after he became a devotee, he didn't want to step on even the insects. He was so conscious about life. He was so careful. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Okay, any other question? Krishna Maharaj, just extending that question from just now, from Prabhu, like you mentioned that Prabhupada didn't allow the devotees to kill the mosquitoes. Aren't we allowed to actually kill, Prabhupada mentioned, I think, to, to kill any animals that bite us, that harm us? No. <laughs> any, any animal which harms us? Yeah, I mean like a mosquito, snakes, and like scorpions and all that. Well, yes, you could. You know, I mean, there may be exceptions. If the mosquito is attacking you, you can defend yourself. <laughs> mosquitoes are attacking you, and you have a right to defend yourself. Hmm. But we, we don't just make a business of going killing. Answered, Maharaj, thank you. We have respect. We have, we have to have respect for all life. And we should think how to help them, give them Krishna consciousness, you know, let them hear the holy name, and give prasadam and so on. Okay. All right, let's go on. Mantra number seven. Uh, <coughs> Yasmin Sarvani Bhutani Atmai Vabud Vijanataha Tatra ko moha ka shoka ekadvamanupashyata. One who always sees all living entities as spiritual sparks, in quality one with the Lord, becomes a true knower of things. What then can be illusion or anxiety for him? Okay, so we heard about the great devotees, the Uttama Adhikari. So here we're continuing again. Prabhupada begins by saying, only the Madhyama Adhikari and the Uttama Adhikari are able to actually see the spiritual position of a living being. So the, the Madhyama Adhikari is also, he also has that kind of vision, he can recognize the position. He can see who is in, who is a good candidate for Krishna consciousness and who is not. So living entities are qualitatively one with the Supreme Lord, just as the sparks of a fire are qualitatively one with a fire. Yet sparks are not fire as far as quantity is concerned. For the quantity of heat and light present in the sparks is not equal to that in fire. The Mahabhagavat, the great devotee, sees oneness in the sense that he sees everything as the energy of the Supreme Lord. Since there is no difference between the energy and the energetic, there is the sense of oneness. Although from the analytical point of view, heat and light are different from fire, there is no meaning 
to the word fire without heat and light. In synthesis, therefore, heat, light, and fire are the same. Prabhupada is presenting his argument here. He wants us to understand the living entities are one with the Supreme Lord. And Prabhupada gives the exit. The living entities are compared to sparks of a fire. And just like sparks come from the fire, and they have heat and light. But the sparks are not fire as far as quantity is concerned so the living entities are sparks but they're not equal to the fire the mahabhagavat the great devotee sees oneness in the sense that he sees everything as the energy of the supreme lord since there is no difference between energy and the energetic, there is a sense of oneness. So Prabhupada is establishing the oneness, the sense of oneness, the energy and the energetic. The Lord is the energetic and he has different energies. The living entities are the energy. So the, in, a, in that sense, there's a oneness, but at the same time, there's a difference. Prabhupada continues, in this mantra, the word ekatvam anupashataha indicates that one should see the unity of all living entities from the viewpoint of the revealed scriptures. The individual sparks of the supreme of the supreme whole the lord possess almost 80 percent of the known qualities of the lord but they are not quantitatively equal to the supreme lord these quantities are present in minute quantity for the living entity is but a minute part and parcel of the supreme whole to use another example the quantity of air present in a drop is never compared to the quantity of salt present in or the quantity of salt present in a drop is never comparable to the quantity of salt present in the complete ocean but the salt present in the drop is qualitatively equal in chemical composition to all the salt present in the ocean If the individual living and living beings were equal to the Supreme Lord, both qualitatively and quantitatively, there would be no question of his being under the influence of the material energy. In the previous mantra, it has already been discussed that no living being not even the powerful demigods can surpass the supreme being in any respect therefore ekatvam does not mean that a living being is equal in all respects to the supreme lord it does however indicate that in a broader sense there is one interest just as the family just as in a family the interest of all members is one or in a nation the national interest is one although there are many different individual citizens since the living entities are all members of the same supreme family 
their interest and that of the Supreme Being are not different. Every living being is the son of the Supreme Being. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, all living entities, all living creatures throughout the universe, including birds, reptiles, ants, aquatics, trees, and so on, are emanations of the marginal potency of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, all of them belong to the family of the Supreme Being. There is no clash of interest. All right? So, Prabhupada is explaining how the living entities have the same qualities, but in different quantity. Just like the spark from the fire. The spark doesn't, is, the spark may have heat and light, but it is not a fire. So the same way the living entities, we have uh, nearly 80% of the qualities in our perfect condition. That 80% comes from uh, analyzing the different qualities. Uh, it's mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. There are 64 different qualities listed by Rupa Goswami. And he said the living entity in his perfect condition, he will have, he can only have six, 50 out of the 64. So 50 out of 64 means 78%. So the living entity is not equal to God. He's he has the same qualities, but not in the same quantity. So, ekatvam, the sense of oneness is there. Oneness in the sense, oneness in quality, but not in quantity. The example about the salt in the ocean. So, the there's in one drop of water there's salt but in the whole ocean there's a huge quantity of salt yeah. so every living entity is seen as uh, part and parcel of the lord and there's no difference that we all mo we move through these different species of life and in different species of life we take different bodies so we want to understand how we have many brothers and sisters many parts and parcels are there Prabhupada continues in this mantra, the words ekatvam anupashyataha indicate that one should see the unity of all living entities from the viewpoint of the revealed scriptures. The individual sparks of the supreme whole, the Lord, possess almost 80% of his known qualities, but they are not quantitatively equal to the Supreme Lord. These quantities are present in minute quantity, for the living entity is but a minute part and parcel of the Supreme Whole. To use another example, the quantity of salt present in the drop is never comparable to the quantity of salt present in the ocean. But the salt present in the drop is qualitatively equal to chemical composition to all the salt present in the ocean. If the individual living entity were equal to the Supreme Lord, both qualitatively and quantitatively, there would be no question of his being under the influence of the material energy. 
But we are under the influence of the material energy, so we have to understand we're not equal to the Lord. That's an interesting argument Prabhupada is giving, that if we were equal to the Lord, then why are we under the influence of the material energy? So we have to understand uh, that this ekatvam, the real oneness, uh, Prabhupada gives the examples about the family or the nation, people in the one nation have the interests of the nation at heart, one family, the family interest. But so we are all of the same supreme family, the family of the Lord. Okay, the spiritual entities are meant for enjoyment, as stated in the Vedanta Sutra, Ananda Maya Bayasat. By nature and constitution, every living being, including the Supreme Lord and each of his parts and parcels, is meant for eternal enjoyment. The living beings who are engaged in the material tabernacle are constantly seeking enjoyment, but they are seeking it on the wrong platform. Apart from the material platform is the spiritual platform, where the Supreme Being enjoys himself with his innumerable associates. On that platform there is no trace of material qualities and therefore that platform is called nirguna on the nirguna platform there is never a clash over the object of enjoyment here in the material world there is always a clash between different individual beings because here the proper center of enjoyment is missed the real center of enjoyment is the supreme lord who is the center of the sublime and spiritual rasa dance we are all meant to join him and enjoy life with one transcendental interest and without any clash. That is the highest platform of spiritual interest. And as soon as one realizes the perfect form of oneness, there can be no question of illusion or lamentation. So Prabhupada is discussing more about the platform of oneness <coughs> okay. Uh, Prabhupada explains about how we're all trying to enjoy. And that, that's not wrong. It's the nature of the soul to want to enjoy. But we're meant to enjoy on the spiritual platform. But instead we try to enjoy on the bodily platform. That's the problem. We have to understand the real position. The real enjoyment is on the spiritual platform. And on the spiritual platform, then the Lord is in the center. The center of all activities is there. We are meant to join him and enjoy life with him without any clash. So that is the highest platform. So that is the, the goal to come to that form of oneness where there's no more illusion or lamentation. We want to come out of that material platform, and come to the spiritual platform. A godless civilization arises from illusion, and the result of such a civilization 
is lamentation. A godless civilization, such as that sponsored by the modern politicians, is always full of anxieties because it may be crushed at any moment. That is the law of nature. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, no one but those who surrender at the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord can surpass the stringent laws of nature. Thus, if we wish to get rid of all sorts of illusion and anxiety and create unity out of all diverse interests, we must bring God into all our activities. So Prabhupada is again emphasizing what is the real position of oneness, that it must be with God in the center. As we heard in the very beginning of the Ishopanishad, the Ishabasha society with God in the center. So in all of our activities, there must be the Lord. Prabhupada continues, the results of our activities must be used to solve the interest of the Lord, to serve the interest of the Lord, and not for any other purpose. Only by serving the Lord's interest can we perceive the Atma Buddha interest mentioned herein. The Atma Buddha interest mentioned in this mantra and the Brahma Buddha interest mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita are one and the same. The Supreme Atma or Soul is the Lord Himself, and the Minute Atma is a living entity. The Supreme Atma or Paramatma alone maintains all the individual minute beings, for the Supreme Lord wants to derive pleasure out of their affection. The Father extends himself through his children and maintains them in order to derive pleasure. If the children obey the Father's will, family affairs will run smoothly with one interest and a pleasing atmosphere. The same situation is transcendentally arranged in the absolute family of the Parabrahman, the Supreme Spirit. So Prabhupada is giving examples to analogies to support this, uh, this oneness coming to the platform of Atma Bhutta or Brahma Bhutta. Again, understanding that we are not the body, that we are spirit souls living in a material body, we should have respect for all forms of life. So this is very important point to understand. Just to finish this purport, the Parabrahman is as much a person as the individual entities. Neither the Lord nor the living entities are impersonal. Such transcendental personalities are full of transcendental bliss, knowledge, and life eternal. That is the real position of spiritual existence. And as soon as one is fully cognizant of this transcendental position, he at once surrenders unto the lotus feet of the Supreme Being, Sri Krishna. But such a Mahatma or great soul is very rarely seen because such transcendental realization is achieved only after many, many births. Once it is attained, however, there is no longer any illusion or lamentation or the miseries of material existence or birth and death which are all experiences experienced in our present life. This is the information we get from this mantra 
of Sri Ishopanishad. All right, so Parabrahman, Prabhupada saying it's it's not so common that people can come to that stage of the realizing the Brahman that it it it's difficult. You have to be a, a Mahatma or a great soul, one who is actually in knowledge, then he will surrender to Krishna. Such a soul is very rare. So, to understand this position, we want to cultivate the, the proper mood, understand it. It's, 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 it's not so easy, not such a common thing to come to that position, to realize our spiritual nature and to act on that platform. It's a challenge. But this is Krishna consciousness. We have to surrender to Krishna. And by the grace of Krishna, we can overcome all these obstacles. So when we understand fully our spiritual identity, then we will surrender to Krishna. And when we surrender to Krishna, then the Lord will reveal everything to us. There's no longer any illusion or lamentation. All right, so we'll stop here tonight. Are there any questions? Yes, any question from anybody? Okay, if there are no questions, then we will stop here. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank we'll you, Maharaj. Thank 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 you, Maharaj.